Wrapping up this edition of Sports Medicine Weekly here on 670 The Score, Steve Cashel with Dr. Brian Cole. Time now for the staple of the show. We have a lot of fun with this each and every week. Ask the doctor, and you can get involved, folks. Go to our website, sportsmedicineweekly.com, and click on the, the tab where it says Home on the far left side, and then you'll see Dr. Brian Cole, Steve Cashel, and contact. Click on Contact, and you will see where you can leave your name, email, and comment and submit a question for Dr. Brian Cole. I got a great one here for you, Doc. Uh, you know, the men and the women, of course. You always think of the women doing yoga. A lot of men are into it, though. But uh, this young woman asks, I've been doing yoga, Dr. Cole, for the past few months, and I know that it's clearly helpful with flexibility, but wondering if it builds strength. Uh, great question. And having done yoga, not frequently, I will tell you, you certainly feel like you're working muscle groups based upon core and position and static positioning and things like that. But it's interesting. When you look at the literature that has looked at this, it does a very good job for flexibility, but it does not do a tremendous job for building large muscle muscle strength, okay? So it suggests and the take-home is that yoga is great as part of your workout regimen, but this is an area that if you're trying to build endurance and you're trying to build strength, which is really important as we age because strength can build muscle and bone mass, right? So you like we like loading activities. So it may be beneficial that while yoga can build some strength, you can do it uh, periodically and somewhat sporadically uh, if you stay at it. But it's not huge gains in strength and it can maintain things. But if you really would like to – be, get stronger, and that's one of your goals, I would say that yoga would be an adjunct to a cross-training regimen where you do things that are cardio, you do yoga, and then you do something in terms of strength training with weights and things of that nature. So that's the take-home. It's not great for strength. It's not certainly a disadvantage, but there's many other things that build strength maybe more efficiently than yoga as your only form of exercise. All right, great question. Appreciate that one. All right, here's another good one, Dr. Cole. Uh, I have heard, Dr. Cole, that men lose weight faster than women. Is that true? Yeah, this is a whole area of science, and it has a lot to do with the way that men versus women distribute fat. So all of us get subcutaneous fat. That's sort of the thickening, the things that you see, right, Steve? But men tend to get visceral fat around their organs, and... Keeping weight, well, it's bad because (laughs) it's associated with uh, cardiovascular disease, right, heart disease, and it's sort of that hidden thing, and it's sort of like what we call the skinny fat person. You can actually find people who don't look to be overweight, excess BMI, but BMI, they don't have excess BMI by uh, when you see them, but they're fat, and they're they're fat in a different way. They have visceral fat, so visceral fat is something you can actually look for with DEXA scans and different types of things, but men tend to put it around their organs internally, and women have this propensity to get subcutaneous fat in their skin and what's really visible, right? You know, everyone, people hate both of those equations, yeah, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. But the, the, the difference is this. To keep, to, to get weight off and to keep it off, it has a lot to do with your metabolic activity. And the more lean body mass you have, right, the better, it, your body basically turns into a furnace and you can keep it off. And when you lose visceral fat, which is preferentially lost over, say, subcutaneous fat in preference for – and as you build lean body mass, you tend to burn off that visceral fat. Men are a greater advantage because they carry around that visceral fat more than women do. So the studies have basically shown when you look at calorie restriction and dieting and exercise and so forth that, you know, like it or not, this is one area where men have an advantage. But it has to do a lot with how that fat is distributed deep inside and around their organs versus women who tend to do it underneath their skin in the subcutaneous tissue. All right, Doc, continuing on with our Ask the Doctor segment. Got a good one for you here. I often hear, this from Joe, by the way, in Kenosha, I often hear that I should be using a lot of ice post-operatively. How much ice is too much ice? That's a great question, Joe. So here's the deal with that. There Early on after surgery or even after injury, ice is critical to reduce swelling and inflammation and pain. But too much ice can be a problem. So some of these cold devices can get below 40 degrees. They can get as cold as, say, 38 degrees. And if it is in direct contact with the skin for a prolonged period of time, especially if it's something that's had recent surgery where the blood supply could be compromised, 
you can actually get frostbite. And even worse, I've seen examples of full thickness skin loss after ice has been applied to the skin. So we've got to be very careful because the directions will differ for various devices. Some of, them, some of them can get quite cold, but in general, you don't want to have the ice in direct contact with the skin. So a thin layer between it could be a dressing, could be ace wrap, could be a gauze. And as well, the surface should be dry. It should not be wet because that can lead to a uh, higher incidence of frostbite. And we generally use a rule of thumb of tw- no more than 20 minutes at a time. Now, right. there are deviations from that, and I can give lots of examples, but I think the safest um, take-home, all things being equal, is no more than 20 minutes of skin exposure for ice at a given time. I got another one related to ice. Um, A Bulls fan asked me this one. You know, back in the day, we don't see it as much, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, when Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen left the game for probably the last time, right? I mean, you know, they, they played into the fourth quarter, Bulls were winning big, they went on the bench. They iced both knees, right? Mm-hmm. They put You could yes. see bags of ice yes. with these guys, Michael and Scotty, on the bench. Um, if they were to come back in the game, is that a bad thing? I mean, when, is that finally where, you know, can you yeah. ice your knee in the middle of a game and come back? I think you can, but you feel stiff. I mean, it's really, it, it definitely changes your... Is that to your, avoid the tendonitis? Or yeah. is that for the tendonitis? Same, you know, same thing as I was alluding to. It just reduces inflammation and swelling okay. and, and pain. And you know, look as in, in these athletes, when you look at the amount of minutes that some of these guys play and the the repetitive nature of it, um, if they have an at risk joint, it's not like every joint gets packed in ice because some of them are fine. So, if, for example, all of our baseball players, every pitcher, they're in the lock when they're done, right? When their series is over, they're in the locker room. They have a big bag of ice and, and basically cellophane wrap around their shoulder to keep that ice on there for 20 minutes. So that's to re- that's recovery. That's part of our recovery. So, But never great, during the game. Uh, well, I wouldn't say never, but it could, I, I am, it's, it could be very tough to warm up again after you've iced the joint down. Uh, so you typically would do it when you know they're done. Okay, why did we see it 15 years ago with guys like Jordan and Pippen on the bench? I don't see that now. Is that a fact that... Most guys, basketball players, they wait or games yeah, just closer. Everyone's in the game at the look, end. If a guy is sore and there's something going on, and you know he's not going back in, but you want to physically keep him on the bench, yeah, that then they're gonna they may pack him in ice at that time. But typically, what happens is the game is over, guys come back, and everyone's getting iced in the locker room for especially the joints that are at risk or they've had previous injuries or surgeries. All right, we're out of time. Great stuff. Many thanks to our producer, Shane Reardon. Our coordinating producer is Teresa Ann Seeger. Also want to thank David Cole for managing the website, business operations, as well as Samantha Smith from MOR. For Dr. Brian Cole, I'm Steve Cashel saying so long. Thanks for listening to Sports Medicine Weekly here on 670 The Score. Up next on The Score, inside the clubhouse, a great baseball show with Bruce Levine and Matt Spiegel. Talk with you again next week. Have a great Saturday, everybody.